we spend a very substantial proportion of our adult lives at work. As a work and organizational psychologist, I'm really interested in the impact that our work has on us, and particularly whether our work actually impacts on our health. And I was a little taken aback recently when I saw some very recent statistics from the European Working Conditions Survey, which show that anywhere from 15 to 41 percent of workers say that work actually impacts their health negatively. Now, whatever way you look at it, and whatever the specific percentage is, that amount of people from that amount of countries is a lot of people. The reason that work can impact our health is normally due in some way to the stress that we associate with work. And it does seem like we're feeding that stress more and more over the last number of years. In 2010, 8% of the EU workforce indicated that they were stressed. In 2015, that had gone up to 15%. 2018, 19%. And in a similar survey that was done in the US, 35% of working Americans reported experiencing chronic stress at work. So there is no denying that work is stressful. And I'm not going to try and deny it. But there are two sides to every story. And I'm a little bit concerned that work is getting a bad reputation. And so today, I want to look at the other side of the story. I want to speak up in defense of work, and I want to find the ways in which having passion, motivation, and energy in our jobs is actually good for us. And really what this boils down to is not the amount of motivation that we have in our jobs, but it's the type of motivation that we have in our jobs. And I want to talk to you a little bit about those types of motivation. But first, I just want to look a little bit about how work is actually important in our lives. If nothing else, Work gives us a reason to get up in the morning. Now, you might be saying, God, that's not such a great reason, not that motivating. But actually, in our lives, it's extremely important for us to feel like our lives have meaning and our lives have purpose. And work is one of the really important domains in our lives that gives us this sense of meaning and it gives us this sense of purpose. It allows us to have an impact on something or someone, and it's a place where we achieve many of our important successes. And all of these things are quite motivating. But before I get into that in a little more detail, I want to ask you to take a trip down memory lane. If I asked most of you today, what were some of the happiest memories that you could think of? The majority of you would say that at least some of those memories came from your childhood. When we were children, we didn't have all those worries that we have as adults. We didn't have to worry about paying the mortgage or paying the bills. We didn't have to worry about what promotions we were getting in work or where we were going to get our next job. Our biggest worry was probably how quickly can we finish our homework so that we can go out playing with our toys or with our friends. And certainly for me, when I was a child, I spent hours and hours running around playing games with, with my friends. I didn't think, God, where am I going to get the energy to go do this? put in this effort. I spent days and weeks coming up with imaginary scenarios about the different trips and travels that my dollies were going on. I wasn't worried about, was that going to be creative enough, or did I have enough imagination to come up with a good idea? They just came. And in many ways, what we're doing when we're playing is not that different to what we do in our jobs. But for some reason, it becomes extremely effortful when we start to get paid for it. But it would be really nice if we could harness that type of um, experience and enjoyment and interest that we had from play as children and bring it into our work. Now, if I was to ask most of you whether you want to admit it or not, most of you will say that some parts of your job, at least, are interesting and enjoyable. And it turns out that these are two really important components of what we might term a very positive form of motivation or what is technically termed autonomous motivation. But it's not the full story. We also need to experience work that allows us to express our values and allows us to achieve important goals in our lives. If I give you a non-work example for a moment. In my spare time, I like to do triathlons. I enjoy doing it. 
it serves an important value for me because I at least think it keeps me a little bit healthy. Um, but that doesn't mean that I don't get lazy about it at times. And on the other hand, sometimes I go, okay, maybe I need to sign up for something to give me that extra little bit of motivation to, to train. And so maybe I go and I sign up for a yeah, triathlon or a half Ironman or something like that. And then I have a goal, I have something to strive for. And if I can manage that enjoyment that I get from training with that goal, that's hugely motivating. I don't, I'm not lazy anymore about my training. And in the same way, if we can harness these four aspects of motivation, this is extremely beneficial for us in the workplace. It gives us energy. We don't have to put a huge amount of effort into those tasks because we enjoy doing them in the first place. But very importantly, what it does is it gives us a sense of passion. We feel passionate about these types of activities. And more importantly, we feel a very specific type of passion, which is harmonious passion. That's the passion that comes from doing something that we enjoy and something that we feel we can make some kind of impact, and it has meaning for us. But not all types of passion and not all types of motivation are created equal. There are a number of other types, and now I'm going to take you down a little memory trip of my own. This is me at the age of about 12 or 13. I had just started secondary school, and it was in the early 90s, I think. And at that time, there was also, a, a, I suppose, a move to be a little bit more safety conscious on the road. And so this was my first helmet. This white, luminous yellow helmet was my first helmet. And I hated it. I wanted a pink helmet, but apparently they didn't have one. So I got this helmet. And I probably should have had a value about safety, but at that stage in my life, I was much more concerned with being cool, and you can clearly see that I was not achieving that aim. <laughs> but nevertheless, I wore that helmet every day as I cycled to and from school. Why did I do this? Well, first and foremost, there were consequences if I didn't do it. I'd get a giving out from my parents. I'd get the safety talk from my parents. But even more than that, my parents told me that they were really worried about my safety, and they asked me to promise them that I would wear that helmet. And they told me that they trusted me to keep that promise. And so every time I thought about not wearing that helmet, hanging it off the handlebars, I felt guilty. Now, these types of experiences, this sense of pressure, this guilt if we don't do something, the sense that there are consequences, is quite a common experience in our jobs. We have deadlines. We might feel guilty if we don't work hard enough or long enough. Um, we might not earn a promotion if we don't feel like we keep working. And that type of controlled motivation, this feeling like we're not um, actually controlling our actions, but they're being controlled by this, these other pressures, this is also associated with a specific type of passion. Now, it's not the passionate hatred I had for my helmet. It's what we refer to as obsessive passion. It's the type of passion that makes us feel that we can't stop checking our emails in the evening, that we have to be constantly connected to work, that we can't take a break from work to go on our annual vacation. And if you think about how it feels when we experience those types of things, it's not very nice, is it? It's certainly not pleasant. And this is why these types of motivation are not very beneficial for our well-being. But one of the very interesting things is we can actually experience these two types of motivation at the same time. We can be doing something that we enjoy, that we find interesting, but also that has a very tight deadline, and we experience pressure about it. And really what we want to do is we want to try to increase that autonomous motivation as much as we can and decrease that control motivation. And it turns out that there's a double benefit if we can do this. Not only does it maintain our well-being, but it also actually increases our work performance. We work very well under those types of motivation. But in today's workforce, in today's workplace, which is characterized by this constant change, there's a lot of pressure to do things very quickly, to change very quickly. And there's also an expectation that we have to engage in these very effortful types of, of tasks at work, things like taking initiative, things like being proactive. And when we have this pressure to do things quickly, to change quickly, and we have to do these very effortful tasks, 
and, and we don't have the compensating effect of this autonomous motivation, what actually happens is our stress and our strain skyrockets and our performance goes through the floor. And of course, in that type of situation, you then have to work harder to try to maintain your work motivation or your work performance, excuse me. And that creates more pressure and that creates more stress. And then we create a vicious cycle. So from what I've told you, we know quite a bit about what makes work a positive experience for people. We know that doing things that enhance our, our autonomous motivation, that are enjoyable, that are important for us, that give us a chance to have an impact um, in some way in our work is very beneficial. And we also know that um, trying to decrease that, that level of, of obsessive passion and controlled motivation is important. But we don't always get to do what we want in our jobs. There's always going to be things in our jobs that we don't want to do. And the question then becomes, how do we manage work so that we increase the enjoyment that we get from work and we enhance the meaning that we get from things that we don't like doing. And it turns out it's not actually that difficult to do this. So I'm going to share with you two ways that we have looked at um, and found evidence for, um, which are actually pretty easy to do. The first of them is really trying to just think about a positive and meaningful work ev event that happens every day for you. We tested the effects of this with a group of caregivers in Germany a couple of years ago. And what we asked them to do was to think about an event that made them feel good or pleased or happy each day at work, and something that reminded them of why their work was meaningful, either for themselves or for others. And they only did this for two weeks. And what we found was that compared to a group who didn't do this, their levels of emotional exhaustion decreased, and emotional exhaustion is a component of burnout, and their levels of chronic fatigue decreased. So just a couple of minutes a day to think about something that was meaningful in your work. Not very hard. On the other hand, even for those of us who are very passionate about our jobs, who really enjoy what we're doing, there are times when we're just tired. Right? And actually, 75% of Europeans will say that at least sometimes they feel absolutely exhausted at the end of their working day. So sometimes we just need some sort of a little energy boost. Maybe we haven't slept very well the night before, or maybe we have that mid-afternoon slump and we need to keep working to get some tasks done. So it turns out that there are a number of strategies that can be effective. And the core of these strategies are that they give us some sort of little respite break from our work during the day. And there's a number of, of types of activities we can do for, to, to achieve this respite effect. But the one I'm going to focus on is savoring nature. And the theory behind savoring nature is that we find it restorative to be in nature. And it turns out we don't actually have to physically be in nature, we can just actually artificially simulate it by looking at a picture of it as well. And the idea is that actually we find nature um, fascinating. And so it captures our attention without taking any energy from us. So we asked a group of, of workers to do um, a type of savoring nature activity every day for 10 working days. And, and this is a, an example of one of the types of pictures that we might have shown them. But we didn't ask them to just look at it. We asked them to really focus on and try to immerse themselves in that image of nature. So you might notice that there's, there looks like there's a little line running along that sea. And actually, that's a group of swimmers uh, in this picture. And if you were doing this activity, we'd ask you to really try to imagine what it must be like to be in that quite big expanse of, of, of salt water in the sea what it might feel like to be surrounded by that cold water, or what it might be like to turn your head to breathe and see these magnificent mountains around you. And what we found is that over the course of 10 days, compared to people who didn't do this activity, people increased their evening vigor or the energy levels that they had every evening after work, and their levels of evening fatigue decreased. So it's a pretty easy way to actually manage our, our uh, energy levels every day. So I started this talk on quite a negative tone. I looked at the ways in which work negatively affects our health. Now, there is a smaller but still substantial proportion of people who say that work has a positive impact on them. And the reason that work has a positive impact on us is when we can harness this really important components of motivation, of enjoyment, 
of meaning, of impact, and when we focus on that. And sometimes, all it takes is finding a rainbow amongst the rain clouds. Thank you very much. <laughs>